All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sujin Gogu. I'm uh, one of the founders of Doctors in Politics that's here. And um, it's a pleasure here to have Dr. Vineet Arora here today, who's gonna be talking about really how to mix in activism and advocacy work while working within a traditional medical and academic setting. Uh, we're often, you know, we see physicians uh, being silent due to the institutional pressure that's surrounding them. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what Doctors in Politics is about, and then I'll uh, ex uh, uh, go into Dr. Aurora's bio a little bit. Um, Doctors in Politics is a group of patient-centered and justice-oriented physicians that believe all policy is health policy. Physicians, you know, particularly during this pandemic, have often felt help helpless and frustrated when they face complex and intertwined health and social challenges of our patients, many of which stem from policy. You know, our goal is to hopefully elect as many uh, patient-centered physicians into political office so we can bring about an improvement in population health and health equity for all Americans. Um, Dr. Vineet Arora uh, is a, a physician at Herbert T. Albison Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago of Medicine, and she serves at the CMO for cl uh, Clinical Learning Environment. She bridges education and clinical leadership to engage trainees um, and staff into the institutional quality, safety, and value mission. Uh, she's been cited and published many times I don't think I have time to go through all those, uh, but uh, she's been cited uh, several times. But she's also been a huge public advocate for our patients. You know, she's um, been involved uh, with public policy committees. She's testified in front of Congress before. And it's just a pleasure to have her today. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Aurora. Thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, to talk about um, two uh, words that don't usually go together, academia and advocacy, um, and two words that I do feel passionate about as somebody who has spent my career in academia, uh, but also not letting go of my advocacy roots. Um, as a resident and a chief resident, I got very involved with the American College of Physicians, and um, that was sort of my entree into advocacy, uh, thinking about really um, a professional societies and um, advocacy for the profession and for the patients. Um, and so I learned a ton through um, serving as the resident representative um, and leader for the Council of Resident and Fellow Members of the American College of Physicians and later on the Health Policy Committee. Um, and that, that really inspired me to actually get a formal degree in public policy at the University of Chicago. And so I think that uh, while you don't need to have a degree in public policy to do advocacy, I felt that it was something that would um, enhance my ability to tread the line and walk that line between academia and advocacy would be to get that formal training and to highlight that, you know, how does one engage, you know? And one of the things I've learned is that um, while, um, you know, advocacy is sort of taboo for physicians, and I don't think it should be, if you actually um, go around an academic campus like University of Chicago, where I live, it's not uncommon that, you know, a law professor here would become the president, you know? So we have a, uh, you know, if you go across the, 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 the campus, you know, from the medical campus into law or the social sciences, humanities, um, you know, a variety of fields, you know, issues around, um, you know, violence and justice and, um, you know, global health and um, equity. These things are being talked about, not just in the medical center, but across the campus. And those academics are participating in advocacy. They're writing op-eds, they're testifying, they are informing policymakers. And so that really led me, my time at uh, the Harris School of Public Policy, um, led me to believe that there should be no taboo about advocacy, um, but we really do as physicians need to think about how to, you know, really thread the needle so that we are not compromising ourselves. And so certainly um, the idea is like with anything, you know, are we able to take care of the patient in front of us um, while we're also serving the interests of the public good and the public health um, and advocating. And so I, um, you know, there's been a lot of polarizing views on this recently. Um, and I will say that 
um, to be quite honest, you know, medicine is advocacy. You know, the the um, the me medical profession relies on advocating for your patients, internal advocacy in your health system to mobilize um, services for your patients. So all those same things that you're doing in your day to day clinical jobs are advocacy. And and the only difference when you think about taking it public is that you're now taking that message public and you're going from the patient in front of you to say, well, why is it that my patient can't afford their medications? You know, what, this is a systems problem. And so um, while doctors are trained usually to think about the patients in front of them and one patient at a time, I would argue that um, the pandemic has really taught us that we can't just wait for the patient in front of us. We have to think about our community um, and the community we serve. And so I think that the advocacy work is really germane to being being a physician. Um, and, and the key is making sure it's done in a way that it's not compromising that doctor-patient relationship, which I think is very possible to do. Um, and it's not unlike, you know, all other safeguards, you know, uh, whether or not you publicly advocate or not, we all hold beliefs, um, whether it's religion or whether it's, um, you know, um, personal beliefs about variety of things. And, and as professionals, we have to censor those beliefs at times and take care of the patient in front of us. So whether or not your belief is public or not, I'm not sure that that really does make a difference at times. I'm actually thinking from a patient perspective, wouldn't it be better to know what your doctor believed, you know? Um, so there's a greater transparency there. Uh, but certainly as for trainees and people starting out, um, it's good to get mentors and get people to support you to think about this. Um, and um, so you can start start thinking about it in a way that does not compromise your career, obviously. Great. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you know, with, with the with the patients that we do see um, in, a tr in, in a traditional setting, you know, even in an academic institution, you know, oftentimes the zip code where patients live, you know, it matters more than the genetic code that they do have. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's a lot of times it's due to the social determinants of health that, you know, uh, patients do have in certain zip codes. So how do we as, you know, physicians really influence that, um, particularly in an academic setting where uh, oftentimes you see um, a lot of these patients that come from, you know, underrepresented minority communities, you know, people of color, people that have been just marginalized this whole time. Absolutely. And so I would say that this is where really um, we are, we are really, our voices are really needed right now because issues related to structural racism and inequities, these things are affecting health, you know, and, um, you know, I'll give you examples from Chicago, you know, from, from the groups that I work with. So, um, you know, one of the groups that I work with that I helped co-found impact Illinois medical professionals action collaborative team, which is a group of healthcare workers in Illinois to advocate for science-based policy. Um, one of the things we feel really passionate about is making sure that, um, you know, our communities are getting equitable care, not just during the pandemic, but afterwards. Um, a specific issue that's arisen um, in our communities uh, was related to uh, where they wanted to place a factory um, and, you know, the environmental racism that occurs when a community that lacks agency is really able to advocate for itself, where a wealthier community with connections to um, the government to lobby can say, okay, you know, we don't want it here. So these are really important issues. And so I would say that as um, physicians, this can be daunting because how do you how do you tackle that beyond the exam room? And this is where I would say you're not going to do it alone. You're going to do it in conjunction with others, whether it be in your residency program, in your medical school, um, in your professional society, um, in your local community. We have very um, active physicians who have partnered with community-based organizations in Chicago. Um, sorry, that there's an ambulance outside my house. We live close to the hospital, but. Um, but the um, you know the real issues are they're very real and so another issue you know I'm reminded is is gun violence and you know it's it's very real and I think that um, you know when when I am reminded um, you know of some of the things where people are like well doctors you stay in your lane you know that is our lane and that is where you look for an opportunity to speak up and highlight that 
as experts in medical care, we have a voice. I'm often asked sometimes, you know, well, what if I'm not an expert? And I often say people diminish their expertise because you know we we doctors so value specialization that I don't need to be the expert in trauma and gun violence. I mean, as a hospitalist, I have treated you know tons of people who have are paraplegic and have sacral decubitus ulcers from from gun violence and and all the sequelae thereof. And so, for me to highlight that story is what matters. And so, authentic stories. Um, and I know that you guys have talked about stories before in terms of advocacy, but bringing those stories to life really do matter. Um, those are the types of things that really move policymakers. Uh, whenever I've talked to a policymaker, you know, they're, they, you know, they read the data, they have people to present graphs and things like that, but they want the story, they want the backstory of what you're seeing. And so that's where, uh, again, um, you can be in a very effective advocate, even if you're not the one testifying, if you just reach out to your congressman and say, I have an important story that I want to share that might help you. Um, and that congressman will then remember you or congresswoman and say, do you have another story? Can you help me with this. And so those are all important relationships to build. Absolutely. You know, I found building stories very helpful. Uh, it's something that, you know, congressmen and women, you know, really relate to more than, you know, advocating for a particular issue. That story just somehow sticks with them. Um, I wanted to ask you another question. How do you deal with the pushback that a lot of times you feel at the community level, you know, particularly when you're trying to um, advocate for community-wide initiatives, you know, such as, you know, low cost daycare, early childhood education opportunities, you know, violence prevention programs in schools, you know, parks and, you know, uh, green spaces. Oftentimes when you advocate for things like that, you're thought of being so progressive and liberal when really it's what's right for our patients. And so how do you balance the political jargon that we're dealing with along with, you know, kind of what our patients really need? Yeah, there's that's a great question, and there's always pushback. <laughs> you know, um, I would say pushback is just part of life, and so um, by learning how to really um, practice your messaging um, in front of your harshest critics, you're going to understand well where is the middle line. And actually, something I learned from policy school is that sometimes it's hard for pendulums to swing really far right or really far left, although recent memory might be um, you know, challenged that. But if you'll notice that sometimes what happens with platforms and messaging is that they are actually more consistent with sort of the middle ground. And so, um, so you have to appeal to the middle. You know, if, if you're too far one way or the other, you, you can, you, you may not get your policy passed. And so while there's advocacy, then there's also the issues around, you know, you know, whenever there's a question of, okay, is there a potential law or a policy here? The question is, is it going to live? Is the bill going to become a law? Is it going to live? And that, that's where seeking help from policymakers and others can help to say, well, what's Maybe you can't get your entire platform through, but you can get parts of it through. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, some of those senior um, vice presidents at folk places like ACP or um, I met, you know, I see somebody mentioned AMA, those kind of, um, you know, sometimes our organizations may sound like they swing conservative, partly they swing conservative because they are trying to move the law. And in order to move the law, like everything, you need that bipartisan support um, to really get the law passed. Having said that, there's lots of ways um, locally, regionally, that you can make a difference. And so raising your voice, writing an op-ed, um, you know, sending in your stories, those are things that really move the needle. Before a law is created, the political will and the conversation has to change. And if the conversation isn't even there, then you have to be able to start the conversation. And that's really where I think doctors' voices and communities do matter. Um, and so again, there's always gonna be pushback, but the question is, are you doing the right thing for your patient? Do you believe in what you're saying? And do others believe in you? And so I have a group of you know four or five people that I kind of run things by. I think everyone has those four or five people. And I'm like, am I way off base? or is this is this you know decent and if they're like yes one two three four five yes i'm like okay this is a go like we have um we have liftoff and 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 you want to surround yourself by people not just that are like oh yeah i always agree with you but by people who are going to be like 
you know, let's think about how this will be perceived. You know, remember, I, I always am thoughtful as well because as physicians, you know, as practicing physicians, you know, we are the top 1%. We are an elitist profession. And so we need to be seen as fighting for our patients and not for ourselves. And so whenever possible, you know, and I think that is sometimes hard and the, you know, for example, in the pandemic, we did have to fight for ourselves for PPE, but remember we were fighting for all healthcare workers. We were fighting for the public um, so that we could save lives. But those types of advocacy, um, when we have to speak, you know, um, sort of, you know, directly in our, in our, you know, in, in alignment with our own conflict can be difficult. Um, and that, that can be difficult to pull off. And so I will say that there are times when um, I often say to a lot of people, especially trainees, you know, remember the patients that we serve and how can we advocate for them? Because I mean, of course, everyone's always excited about, you know, whatever it is that they want to advocate for their own, you know, group, but you always have to think, well, what can I do for the well, how can I lift my voice up and raise it for people who don't have a voice? That's really what matters most. And when you speak out against your own self-interest, it's very, very powerful. Those are the types of things that carry. I have a question here from a audience member. Can you talk about how you've navigated institutional barriers to being an advocate or activist when you wanna speak out on a particular issue or bill or speak on TV or at a press conference you know, the question is kind of really, how do you get permission uh, from your institution to do that? I think that's where doctors really struggle, um, is how do you navigate getting permission and it, it working Absolutely. out? Great question. Thank you for this question. So I happen to know our media folks pretty well. And there are times when I will be representing our institution in the sense that perhaps they got me an interview and they know that I'm representing our institution. There are times that I'm not representing our institution and I'm speaking strictly as an individual. Uh, there's op-eds that I've written where I've not put my institution's name there. Um, and there are times when I, but I always let my media people know. I say, oh, you know, I, I did this interview. Here's what I said, you know, I, but I'm not, you know, not representing University of Chicago. So I'm very transparent with them. In general, I will say that I, I tend to be at a freedom of speech place, uh, University of Chicago. But but again, I'm you have to be wise. And being wise means you're not going to, I believe, in internal advocacy. And so if I had a problem or if somebody had a problem with something that I was doing in my institution, I would hope that they would come to me and internally advocate. Um, by the time they go and externally advocate, the ship has sailed and something else has happened. Um, external advocacy, again, is really not about your organization, it's really about the issues. And so as long as my organization understands that I'm advocating for the issues and those issues are aligned with what my organization needs, it's a win-win. Um, and so I'm carefully, I carefully think about that. And so if I feel that I might be not the right person to speak about an issue because of my institutional affiliation, I will pass along that media opportunity to somebody else. And I think that's very important because you don't need every media opportunity. What you need is the media opportunities that align with your voice and your issue and that your institution can get behind you. And that that's gonna go very far. And so a great example is, um, you know, we wrote an op-ed recently about the India crisis um, with several friends. I used my institutional affiliation. I let my institution know they were happy to share it because it also was synergistic with what our institution was doing. And so just to give you an example of, um, you know, um, you know, I'm for an op-ed that might be a little bit more controversial, I may not really, you know, use my institutional platform. Having said that, it's very easy to figure out where I am. So I do need to be thoughtful. And I'm always thoughtful to be like, do I think that this would damage my ability to perform my work or my job? And most of the time, the answer is no, um, because most of the time it's raising up an issue. It may not be you know, related to my institutional work, in which case then, you know, let, there can be separation of church and state. Having said that, you have to know your media people. You have to know what they what they like. Some are very conservative, some are very liberal. I have a very strong relationship with my media people. And in general, your media people are going to like it when people from your institution are in the news. Um, you know, that's actually considered a positive. Um, and so, you know, again, 
going to your media folks, telling them you're interested, maybe you need media training. These are all positive things so that they know you're interested. Awesome. No, thank you so much. That was such real good advice. Um, we're at 20 minutes and I don't want to keep you any longer. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and um, we hope to have you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me and, uh, you know, happy advoca advocating. And certainly I feel for those that are treading uh, this uh, line. And so if you have any questions, feel free to um, message me on Twitter at Future Docs. And um, I'd be happy to talk more about academia and advocacy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Aurora. Pleasure. Thank you.